Hi, I'm Carrie Kirastar Ellis, author of the 21st Century Superhuman Book Series. And today I have with me Dr. Sean O'Mara, and he is going to tell us some amazing things about how to be more healthy, how to regenerate our bodies, how to be the healthiest and most fit we can possibly be. Yeah, it's nice to see young people yeah. that get health, you know, at their early age, because oh. usually it's uh, us older types that have lost our health and reclaimed it that, yes. you know, are more interested in health. So it's refreshing to see I've got all my kids are really interested in health that the youngest is the one that's kind of coming up and he's slowly getting into it. I started when I was 19 yes, and I'm 72 and nobody would ever know it. I mean, I'm, yeah. I've had, I have a really healthy, vital life, which is amazing. And I have just been committed to the path of health, well-being, you know, my personal growth for my whole life. That's great, Carrie. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Interesting. I have so many exciting things. I want to bounce back and forth with you. So I'm really excited about if today we can discuss how vegans and vegetarians could accomplish what it is that you're teaching, because I know it's a sidetrack from what the carnivore community talks about, but I started keto a year ago with having fish and um, I've been vegan vegetarian for like I don't know, 54 years or something like that. So it's a really long time. And I know I heard you say one time that you have some patients that are vegan or vegetarian. I thought maybe you might have a little glimpse into what that can, what the possibilities are there. There's, there's like 1.5 billion vegans and mostly vegetarians, but then like 300 million vegans on the planet. Like it's a huge population. And of course, a lot of them are in India or maybe a poor, poorer countries where maybe they don't even have a lot of choice or it's an old spiritual belief. And I think a lot of modern people that are, it is for a lot of reasons, environmental reasons, spiritual reasons, not wanting to harm the animals. So I think we have a lot of reasons that people have chosen the vegetarian path. And I know it's not your usual direction, but I just love to bounce it back and forth with you. Your dedication to truth seeking and to living something that's purposeful for you seems really important. So if you can do just a little nutshell on your background, that'd be really great. I grew up in a pretty typical home in the Washington DC area. My dad is a government employee and I went to public schools and I was uh, very interested in medicine as a child and in science, but I ended up going into law enforcement. You know, uh, I I liked law enforcement and did uh, work as a police officer for a while. And then I did undercover narcotics work and it. It was very interesting wow. to see um, the, the addiction role uh, and uh, the impact of uh, substance abuse from a law enforcement perspective. But uh, I, um, I ended up going to law school and becoming a prosecutor. Wow. And so I, I had further insights into substance abuse and narcotics. And I, in fact, became a narcotics prosecutor. So I was really essentially doing full-time prosecution on narcotics offenders. So wow. I bought drugs, did undercover work. I ended up doing uh, criminal prosecutions of narcotics offenders, um, you know, uh, ultimately down the road. And what was remarkable to me is... Um, the complete lack of attention whatsoever to science when it comes to uh, addiction and the use of substance abuse. And now, um, you know, I uh, got my renewed my interest in science as an attorney and decided to go back to school and go to medical school. Uh, I ended up getting a scholarship through the Army. And wow. uh, through my time in the Army, I trained as an emergency medicine physician. I was, uh, I just loved, I'm very passionate in life. I've just, I got a lot of motion, motivation. And so I, I was passionate about being an emergency medicine physician in the army. And I got selected to be the outstanding physician of the year for the whole army and um, end up uh, being selected to provide medical care to the president, President Bush, President Clinton, and uh, Vice President Cheney and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Secretary of State uh, uh, former General Colin Powell. So a lot of really interesting people. And I set up a company taking care of very wealthy uh, hedge fund principals, managing directors. These were people that were legitimately billionaires and world family members. And, you know, from my time doing that, I I saw a lot of uh, 
very affluent people, but a lot of disease in both the very affluent and the very poor, and probably mm -hmm. less disease right in the middle. And uh, it's you know when you're when you're marginalized in those those areas like uber uber high net worth individual like a, a royal family member and uh or you know a billionaire versus a, a, a very impoverished person they both make bad decisions when it comes to health wow and so i lost interest in taking care of those billionaires because my passion evolved to wanting to solve problems and reverse disease and all my really wealthy clients, when I did concierge medicine, wanted to have their disease treated or when they had a disease event, you know, have it responded to, like wait around to have a stroke. So there was like no interest in, you know, serious interest in preventing the stroke. Right. You know, they were perfectly happy to have, you know, uh, literally pay for a plane to be on standby 24 hours a day. Um, and have three neurologists engaged um, in a service to provide coverage 24 hours a day, wow. have a CT scanner in their home with lytic agents ready to push the clot-busting drug. So basically spending in excess of, you know, millions of dollars, um, you know, to have this capability, this purely reactionary, rather than live in a lifestyle that would obviate the need for any of that. So wow. I abandoned that kind of resistance that they had and, and their affinity for the good life they thought was a good life. Right. Uh, to work now with individuals who are motivated to uh, first explore and then pursue becoming the best biological versions of themselves possible. Yes. And I can't think of anything more interesting to... For me to work on my, spend my life working on, then trying to figure out how to biologically optimize humans and kind of sum it up this way. How do we make humans superhumans? Yes. I actually think it's already been done. I think our ancestors of old were superhumans relative to homo sapiens today. I yes. think were we to be transported back 50,000 years ago, we would encounter our ancestors of, of old they were just super strong, super fast, and super smart. Yes. And they, unlike ourselves, would have gotten better literally as they aged. And unfortunately, our species today typically declines. You and I, are, I think, are exceptions to that. We, yes. I don't think, are certainly not having the decline that um, our counter or most of our contemporaries have. But for, you know, uh, our old ancestors, they really would have gotten better. And if there was something the equivalent of the NFL or some professional league, and there was, you know, they were kind of big, big hunting matches or mm -hmm. there weren't competitions, right. but something really a big, important hunt. Yeah. Um, so the pros would show up to hunt and they were, uh, in fact, both men and women. There were many yes. women hunters that would have um, certainly eclipsed and done outperformed males and whoever was best would be in those prize, um, prize places. And it wasn't the young men and women that were at the tip of the spear in that hunt. It was the gray hairs. Wow. The gray hairs that still preserved their biology uh. but would have acquired all the hunting skills and expertise to perform. Beautiful. And so I like to challenge people today with the, the insight and awareness and prediction that if we are successful at ad adopting in mass these principles of biological optimization that I have started and I'm promoting, and it migrates into the professional ranks of professional sports, you will see the best NFL players will be men and women in their 50s and 60s, because wow. we will have solved the problems of chronic disease and have gained the decades of playing experience right. that's now missing. And most professional athletes end their career, professional careers in their 30s, if, if they make it that far, because of abuses of their lifestyle that preclude them from ever recovering. The young can recover from injuries. 
It's the Joe Feismans, the older players that get these injuries and they're done. But if they, those professional athletes knew about these biometrics and more importantly, what you need to do in terms of lifestyle to optimize them, they would not get themselves in a position where they can't recover and they would simply continue to improve in their professional career. So I'm really excited about the future. I love what I'm doing and thank you, uh, Carrie, for having me. Um, on your podcast to be able to talk about this. Thank you for coming. And um, I'd like to add to your, you know, view on the billionaires, you know, or the the elite who took care of their health in this kind of way. You know, I just look around the planet, you know, as I go to the grocery store, as I ride a bicycle down the street and look at people in their cars. And I just think, ah, oh, it's amazing how either overweight, out of shape, you know, ailing, so, so many people are, and I just want to run around and shake them and say, come on, you guys wake up. You can be healthy. You can be vital. You can regenerate yourself and, um, please, you know, learn, grow. And, um, so it's everywhere. It's just, yeah. Like lemons going over a cliff, you know, people yes. in mass, um, yeah. are blind to the reality of their situation. Um, that they they're they're just in a in an army of lemons that are marching over a cliff and they they can't see what's happening. Or another analogy I give is that uh, they're they're out in a tide in the ocean that's carrying them far out where they're ultimately going to die and drown. But a few I call them the remnant. My clients um, mm -hmm. are swimming parallel and they're going to get themselves out of the riptide. Yes, and uh, be able to get to shore where there's a a great big. Um, you know, uh, luau with uh, wonderful grass-fed beef and and a, and a good dinner waiting them and a good lifestyle. Uh, but you really have to see yourselves uh, as being surrounded in mass by the majority of people who are living unhealthy. And to kind of sum it up this way, um, I like to challenge people, if you're listening today, uh, to think about this question. What is humanity's biggest problem? What is humanity's biggest problem? And a lot of people will have different opinions about it. And I've had the opportunity to think about it a lot because I'm a problem solver, a problem, a troubleshooter. I love to solve problems. I've loved to do it since I was a little kid. And so um, to me, before I die, I want to be able to make a substantial contribution to what I believe is humanity's largest problem. So here is Sean O'Meara's considered opinion on that subject and what it is is chronic disease. And the reason wow. is that chronic disease is our species, humanity's biggest problem is nothing costs more money. Nothing do we spend more money on trying to solve, no other problem. Nothing impairs the daily lives of people more. Nothing impairs their work productivity more. Nothing impairs corporations more. And nothing destroys the quality of life of people more. And nothing kills more people more than chronic disease. Now, if it's that big of a problem, how come we never hear about it? Why isn't it being discussed? And I would submit to you that the system doesn't want you to be aware of that problem. Because if you know the enormity of that problem in the aggregate, then you might start assess its influence and contribution in your own life. And if you were to do that, you might just become a bad consumer of this treatment model of disease. So if you're listening today to this podcast, my challenge to you is beyond thinking about what humanity's biggest problem is and understanding that, begin to assess just how much of a destructive role chronic disease is playing in your life. Credit to Peter Thiel, who was once asked on a podcast, and I thought it was interesting, what is your biggest problem on a daily life? And he responded, my, my biggest problem on a daily basis is humanity's biggest problem on a daily basis. And that is nobody has figured out a solution to chronic disease. Wow. He's asking the right questions. He's wrong about nobody has figured it out. I don't want to take credit. I've had a lot of contributions from other people, but- the truth is we do, but Peter doesn't know how to reverse chronic disease. And it begins with uh, identifying the correct metrics for eliminating chronic disease in your life. 
and understanding the strategies to follow those metrics to make sure that those metrics are changing for the better. And so I think that's it's kind of a nice setup for what we're doing. And I'm I'm happy to segue if you'd like into one of those specific um, metrics, visceral fat, and talk about it in the context of vegans and um, and and uh, uh, carnivores. So um, yeah. one of the and let uh, me just repeat again. There's I think 1.5 billion, according to the research I did, vegetarians, 300 million more vegans on the planet. So there's a lot of people who it would really benefit to help see your perspective as you look actually into the tissues of the bodies and tell us. I'm also curious what you think about the how much the processed food industry has contributed to this. I mean, of course, it's a huge part of it and people just think it's normal food, but it's not. So maybe you can uh, address some of that while you're giving us yeah. your, your view here. Yeah, so what I'll do is maybe first by way of uh, introduction to this biomarker, just show this graphic to help illustrate, um, you know, what we're gonna take a look at. So we're gonna use an MRI uh, scan, scanner to scan through uh, an abdomen. I'm going to show you an image of a of a uh, vegan who's been eating vegan and somebody who's been eating carnivore. Now, keep in mind these are just ends of one. Okay, so they're just example of one person, but but they very closely uh, follow the anecdotal experience that I've had now for over ten years doing MRI imaging on vegans and carnivores. So typically they're fairly representative. Uh, so when you do a scan through the abdomen, it creates an image like this in black and white. Fat shows up on an MRI as white. So wherever you see white on an MRI scan here, it's going to be a type of fat. And there are several types of fat. And some fat is good and some fat is bad. But for the average person, nobody really knows that. They just think lump it all together, fat is bad. But you really you want to have two types of fat, They'll, they're associated with longevity and improved health and improved quality of living. And then there's four types of fat that just do the opposite. They're associated with disease and declining health and uh, declining uh, lifespan. So on an MRI, muscle shows up as dark. So the dark structures on the sides are your muscles. These are muscles in the back. This is your vertebral body. And this is, these two are your psoas muscles, which make up your four. And I like to point out the four because four is something a lot of people do when they work out. And in case you ever wonder what the heck is hurting so bad when you're doing a core workout, it's these two little buggers right there. And they're really important. As it turns out, I have found uh, a lot of utility using an MRI to look specifically at the core within individuals. And it gives me a great barometer on how healthy somebody is looking at those particular muscles inside, which by the way, you never get to see unless you're a surgeon or you're a physician who's doing an MRI CT scanner. So the rest of this white stuff inside is the deadly stuff called visceral fat. And that was the first biomarker that we came up with. And, and it was actually discovered um, or shared with me first by a researcher, an MD, PhD researcher named Dr. Singh. And this was his very first MRI on himself. And so he's got a thin layer of fat on his outside, a lot of fat on the inside. So he's a fat, a tofi, thin outside, fat inside. And the way he found out about this visceral fat is he was studying people's backs. So he was looking at back pathology. And he noticed people that had the worst backs have the most amount of white stuff inside of them. And the people that had the healthiest facts had the least amount of white stuff inside of them. So we saw this early on a relationship and association between visceral fat and back disease. And then as he explored it more, he realized that it was associated with virtually all forms of chronic disease. And in fact, we went on to apply for a grant and, and earned a grant from the National Science Foundation. We awarded a grant to study uh, visceral fat and chronic disease. And we saw that in 6,000 people that we scanned their adjuvants, that every self-reported form of chronic disease in those 6,000 Americans got either better or went away as they eliminated visceral fat. No 
other marker in the history of humanity will improve a human being more and get rid of disease than getting rid of visceral fat. And that's the strongest point I'd like to leave with your audience if they really want to understand that visceral fat. So real quick, a couple um Couple so the two pictures that you just had, Dr. Sean, were, what was the bottom and the top one? Is, was there a difference between them? Well, this just shows visceral fat in red. Okay. So we've painted it red and subcutaneous fat in yellow because okay. there's a big difference. And subcutaneous fat is two areas of fat lumped together. And that's what I'm just about to show. So the in this scan here, and I'm just going to move to this side because it's slightly better in this 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 view here. Um, this is visceral fat, and then this is fat in the muscle called myosteatosis or human marbling. So most people listening today are familiar with marbleization of a steak. Well, you can get marbleization of your own muscles, including your back muscles. And when they start to get mar marbleized like that, they stop working so good. So when your muscles don't work so good in your arms, you may not be able to carry groceries as well. So as you get older, you get weaker, and two things happen. Your muscles stop performing as well, so they're weaker, and they don't move as well, so they're not as coordinated. And the other thing that happens is they shrink, so they literally lose mass. So your muscles get smaller. So as you see white, you'll see less dark. Literally, the white stuff makes the dark stuff go away. <clears throat> but it's this subcutaneous fat that I want to concentrate on here and tell you about. There's a black line going between this subcutaneous fat, separating it into two compartments. One is deep subcutaneous fat, and the other one is superficial subcutaneous fat. Superficial because it's closer to the skin, deep because it's closer to the muscle. These two types of subcutaneous fat are like bricks and clouds difference. The deep subcutaneous fat is associated with disease and death and de deteriorating your quality of life, just wow. like this fat and just like myosteatosis muscle fat, because they all secrete inflammatory substances that go and destroy tissue. Superficial subcutaneous fat right here is beneficial. It secretes a molecule called adiponectin, A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N. Adiponectin is associated with preventing heart attacks, strokes, cancer, chronic disease, uh, fatty liver disease. It's beneficial. So it's a type of fat that you want. Wow. But oddly enough, a lot of people are doing liposuction to get rid of it. And they reported to me <clears throat> when they've done that, they've regretted it <clears throat> because it affects their health because it gets, they didn't know that. They don't tell you when you get that sucked out of you, but it does affect your health and it affects the appearance of your face. So wow. many women that get liposuction have reported their faces have become less attractive. Now, what that means to me as a researcher is they have become less healthy because they've lost this depot this collection of beneficial fat that produces this molecule. Another beneficial fat is brown adipose tissue or brown fat. And brown adipose tissue is aligned with better metabolism and better functioning mitochondria. So you, you want rid of visceral fat. You want to get rid of deep subcutaneous fat. You want to get rid of muscle fat, human marbling. And the fourth fat that maybe we'll show you a picture of is fat around the heart or fat inside organs, yeah. and that, that can happen too. So when it comes to a vegan- Let me though, ask you a quick question, Dr. Sean, before sure. you go away from that image. So that fat that somebody would have removed with liposuction, can they replace, can they restore that or is that not restorable? Is that, is that like baby fat? Well, it can be restored through lifestyle, but you can't go through another surgical procedure and have it removed. It's sort of like if you change your sex and have, you know, a sex procedure, you know, if you get something whacked off, it's gone. Um, but if you, um, they could put another one back, but it's never going to be the, exactly the same. So if you've had liposuction, um, then you want to correct your lifestyle. Um, and there's no one tip that's like, you know, tell you to, uh, to eat grass fed beef and you're going to develop subcutaneous fat or something like that. Um, it's really a lifestyle. 
Okay. We have noticed that in the strategies that eliminate visceral fat, it paradoxically uh, it, uh, allows you to put on subcutaneous fat. Beautiful. So our strategies that eliminate the dangerous fat cause good fat to go on. And that's a good thing. So we're happy about that. Uh, we don't have to do extra things to get people to, to get that Very super nice. Fat. And what was it you call the person who's thin but has fat inside? Because I would say that was probably my husband over many years. Um, uh, Tofi. Like, Tofi. Yeah. What and very often they're kind of um, long term vegans. Uh -huh. So we see a lot of long term vegans um, losing their subcutaneous fat. If you look at like Dr. Esselstein and Dr. Caldwell or uh, uh, Dr. McDonough yes. uh, or uh, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Al, uh, Al Sharpton, um, these people lose a lot of their subcutaneous fat. Their skin becomes very thin and yes. they, get, they get accelerated sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is the loss of muscle tissue. And so um, a good example of sarcopenia is the small muscles here compared to the large muscles here. This is largely a, a vegetarian who eats a lot of rice and a lot of bread. So they will in fact eat a lot of processed foods. Wow. They're from Bangladesh. This is a regional diet from Southeast Asia. So this gentleman from Bangladesh has a large amount of visceral fat in them. You see mostly white. And when you see a large amount of white, you'll see a small amount of dark. The white shrinks the dark. It literally is causing atrophy and loss of muscle tissue. Wow. And in the absence of a lot of white, when you see a lot of dark, you see big muscles. So on an MRI, organs and muscle and bone show up as dark. So when so you have an MRI, you want to be mostly dark. You want to have an oval shape like you did when you were 16. And you want to ha not have a dad bod like this guy who has a very large sagittal abdominal diameter. The diameter of their abdomen and the sagittal plane, which is from their belly button to their back, is enlarged. And right. that is either when they lay down or when they stand up. And you will see this in older guys and older women. They'll have this pooch. And their organs literally in their upper abdomen start sagging down. They get this belly protruding, and it's oftentimes called the dad bod or a beer gut in males. And, um, uh, and then women like to think it's from childbirth. But heads up, if you've never had babies, you still get this. And there are a lot of women that have flat abdomens who have had babies and don't get this. And it really turns on this inflammatory fat destroying your tissues inside your abdomen. So wow. you really don't know, unless you get scanned, how much of this inflammatory fat you have in there. But what do you think about somebody who's been a vegan who has not eaten much grain? I mean, I kind of come from a culture where we ran these living food institutes and it was more salads, nuts, seeds, um, but a lot of fruit. And I think fruit is also the downfall of it. And I also went through long periods of time being 50 years vegan, vegetarian, varied, but where I felt really protein hungry. And um, I knew that I was, I was doing a lot of athletic things, but I'm wondering if you think the same visceral fat would show up in somebody who didn't eat a lot of grains or um, heavy carbs or refined foods. Yes, you still, we still would see elevated amounts of visceral fat. Everybody is a little different. So it's kind of hard to lump them in. Your question, though, is worthy of further investigation. Right. I don't have as many of those vegans that would eat just vegetables and fruit, uh, rather than uh, most vegans eat a lot of grains. But the ones that still do are tofu. So if you um, are eating more living you know, vegetables and fruit, and you don't eat grains and, and, and maybe processed food as much, you still have that visceral fat and you still have a paucity of the superficial subcutaneous fat. Right. And so I just think if you're listening today and you're a vegetarian or a vegan, get an MRI and see where you're at. So it doesn't matter so much where you're at today. 
It's where are you going to be in three months? Did you get better or did you get worse? And if you're getting worse, you need a course correction. You need to change your dietary strategies and your lifestyle. But so vegans there... and vegetarians are, I'll, have, I'll just cut to the chase. They're as foolish and as ignorant as a big eating muscle head just lifting weights. I mean, they both are ignorant what's going on inside their body. Right, right. You got the one vegan so, who's just eating, you know, vegetables and stuff. And then you got the meat eating, you know, bodybuilder to, oh, I'm healthy. And, you know, those vegans are crazy. They're both crazy because they're not looking at it. You got to look at what's going on inside of your body. It's just not how you look from the outside. So is there an, an explanation you have, if somebody wanted to go out and get an MRI, what would they ask for to get the results that you could look at? Well, the challenging thing is for the majority of people, you got to get a physician order. You oh. cannot get an MRI because uh, it requires a, 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 a order, uh, imagery order from a physician. So you have right. to go and maybe uh, somebody's and already had anything. that. Maybe somebody's already had that because they have an illness or whatever. Yeah. I'd like to gather a few of this type and send them to you if we can. I would love it. If people, you know, are are vegans or vegetarians, um, if they, you know, can send me their um their 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 MRIs, I would I would like to to see and get insights. And especially what would be really helpful. I mean, I I having said that right now, I'm starting to think, well, you know, it's it's sad. There's such, uh, such, um, I don't know, drive and passion that, you know, some people will send this and it, and it can be a little bit misleading, you know, so right. could be a vegan is eating a lot of fruit and vegetables, but they're sneaking processed foods and they don't want to admit to the fact that they're eating wonder bread and, you know, something crazy. And so, um, when I get somebody to come work with me, then, then I can better assess what's going on. I can watch them over a period of time. So right. that's the best thing. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, you know, come and work with me. I can't read an yeah. MRI scan across borders too. Okay. So, you know, people send me their MRI scan. They, they always contact me, try to read it. And it's against the law. I can't practice medicine uh, um, across state borders. So that's a problem. But, but so you're the best opening thing up is, in new states, right? I heard you say yeah. recently. Arizona, yeah, so, Texas, yeah, Florida. We'll be, we'll be expanding to Arizona, Texas, California, New York, uh, hopefully over the next year and over the next six months, Florida, um, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Chicago, Illinois. So wow. we're, we're growing as, as awareness of visceral fat is starting to take off and people are, are recognizing that, you know, it's a short conversation when they go in and talk to their doctor about visceral fat because he or she, the physician, just doesn't know anything about visceral fat. And, and they're, you know, because of that, they're reluctant to do an MRI scan on something they don't know about. And you know, it's not just a physician, it's also the physician radiologist. Right. The radiologist who's reading these scans. And you know, if you if you look at um, the scan, I mean, let me just sum it up. What is the largest part of the abdomen here? For $1 million, Carrie will pretend. What is the largest part of the abdomen? It's visceral fat. <laughs> yeah. And do you know, radiologists don't read it. They're not trained in it. And they do, don't even look at it. And how much of a problem is it? I literally had a client who I ordered an MRI for. They, they took the order form to the, rate, to the diagnostic center. It wasn't the center that I normally work with. They paid the money for the MRI out of pocket so it didn't go through insurance. And then when the image and the request form, you know, order form from me is saying, I, I want a valuation MRI, Donald MRI for visceral fat. The radiologist said, I can't read visceral fat. I don't know how to do that. Um, and they said, give the patient their money back. Literally, they wow. refunded the money because they can't read the most obvious thing that's destroying humanity. Wow. That's the enormity of the problem. So if you're fortunate enough to have tuned into this podcast today, you've got a really good anecdotal experience just how big of a problem it is. It's not taught in medical schools. It's not taught in radiology, re re residency programs. No physicians know about visceral fat and can read about it. There's only one radiologist in the entire world 
is currently reading visceral fat, and that's Dr. Anna Rosa. She's doing podcasts now. She's been on Drew Purit, uh, uh podcast, and uh, she's been on Food Lies with Brian Sanders, and uh, I'll be interviewing her shortly. Um, so she knows about visceral fat. She knows about myosteatosis, deep nice. subcutaneous fat. She's she's fantastic. But you know, there, that's two out of what? How many? We probably have. I'm guessing a close to a million physicians in the world, and there's only two reading this. I mean, wow. this is really a bad situation. It's it's almost like from you know a situation from the heavens. God ordained this crazy you know situation. So. Uh, the Waking best thing up you can do out of ignorance. Get, Waking you gotta up get out a of scan ignorance. and find out what's going on in you, not other people. Don't follow dogma that you just have to eat meat or just eat plants and vegetables. You need to follow what is going on inside your body. It doesn't matter if the 7.9 billion people are all right if it's wrong for you. And so you should be looking at what's going on. Everybody has their own different microbiome, the collection of microbes inside of them, which right. really governs whether you get visceral fat, myosteatosis, deep subcutaneous fat, or superficial subcutaneous fat. So let me ask you, do you think that, I know you're really big on carnivore, you know, ruminant animals and that kind of thing. Do you think a, a vegetarian can shift their visceral fat with fish consumption because it's a zero carb food and enough fats along with that, which might be butter, olive oil. Um, I guess questions are. Yeah. So I'll pull up an MRI of a, a vegan in just a minute. So this guy eats carnivore. This guy eats mostly vegetarian. He's not really vegan, uh, but mostly, mostly veg vegetarian and grain heavy. So these tip pretty typical I have yet to see a vegetarian, uh, a vegan, uh, who was not substantially filled with visceral fat. I'm not saying that they're not out there. It's just that they haven't come to me and everybody, including one physician who came to me and, and I scanned him and I remember saying to him, well, we'll, we'll take a look and we can quantify how much visceral fat you have in, in you. And he said to me, oh, well, Dr. O'Mara, you're not going to see visceral fat in me. I have been vegan for 35 years. Right. And of course, he's filled with visceral fat when we scan him. He has close to 10 pounds of it inside of him. And his response in the 70s, after being vegan for 35 years, was looking at all the visceral fat inside of him and how deceived he was, was to immediately go out and start eating meat. So the MRI ends the lie that you've been telling yourself and believing that you are not as you're not as healthy as you think you are. And That's so when really you get good. this MRI scan, you really should see what's happening. So let's look at this one vegan. Um, and by the way, I love vegans and I have vegan clients. I have vegetarian clients. These are wonderful people that are principled and they do not want to eat meat. I do not fault them. People have their own beliefs about how they want to eat, how they want to live their lives. I just give them the tools to get insights into what they should do to biologically optimize within their value system. So if they want to be vegan, like this guy right here, and I'll show you his, his uh, MRI scan so we take a look. His MRI scan is, is right here. So he's got a large amount of visceral fat and small amounts of muscles. So this vegan came to came to me. He's actually a true vegan from Hin, Hin, uh, from India. So he's a Hindu. We got him scanned and we showed him all this visceral fat. Now, because he was honest, he admitted, I'm eating a lot of bread. I'm eating muffins. I'm even eating donuts. You know, so he was eating some unhealthy processed foods. So what did we do for him? is we got him to first see how much visceral fat he had inside all that disease. And we got him to stop eating the processed foods because it's processed carbohydrates that are worse than regular carbohydrates. It's processed meat that is worse than regular meat. Anything that's processed that's not naturally processed. And what do I mean by natural, by processed process? 
at the hands of humans. Okay, when the humans change the form, move them off, badness, bad stuff. But when nature changes the form, like fermentation, it makes the food better. So you want, you if you're gonna, any processing has to be at the hands of nature. So nature makes things better, not humans. So let's take a look at this vegan, what happened to him uh, on an outward perspective. So this is his face and maybe I can blow it up um, right there to get a sense. This was his face when we did his MRI scan. So it's, uh, his name is VJ, such a nice man. Wow. Uh, from so very inflamed face. And then as um, within about uh, three months, he's substantially reduced, improved his face that much. Now look how much nicer he looks because he's eliminated so much visceral fat that that inflammation of his face is being removed. Now, well, did he start look. eating meat or is this just reducing no, processed he's foods? he's staying vegan. He's just cutting out the processed carbohydrates. Mm. So I told VJ, cut out the processed carbohydrates, eat carbohydrates more in complex form. And then this is critical. Consume fermented foods when you're eating those carbohydrates. And mm. one of the worst things you can do today is be eating carbohydrates uh, especially processed carbohydrates without ferments. So right. my highest recommendation is cutting out carbs, especially carbohydrates, adopting a more meat-centric diet, which is concentrating on meat, uh, I'm sorry, protein and fat, something like keto or carnivore, and, uh, uh, and then cutting out carbohydrates. So VJ, we got him to cut out the processed carbohydrates, to eat complex carbohydrates, vegetables and whole form, and uh, to eat, incorporate fermented foods like kimchi, kvass, curtido, uh, sauerkraut, living, probiotic, fermented, cultured, right. live food. And so you can see his face is substantially improved. But look at his abdomen too, um, Terry. It's very large abdomen here. Yeah. So now how much he's, his abdomen is slimmed down. Beautiful And he continues to, to improve. So yeah. I'll be doing his repeat MRI scan uh, hopefully fairly soon. It's a little bit more complicated um, in India than it is in the United States, but I, I'm excited to be able to go on to social media and sh just share from the inside uh, how much VJ is improving himself from the outside. Beautiful. Of what Beautiful. You know, an interesting thing that happened with me when I went keto a little over a year ago is, which was fish and vegetables. Basically, we got rid of everything in our kitchen that was not, you know, on the list of really pure keto. And um, I began losing age spots on my arms. I wish I had pictures of them, but having been this long-term vegan vegetarian, I had these brown age spots appearing and I was like, no, this is not right. This shouldn't be happening. What is going on? And when I started adding protein and fat and really low carb, I mean, they've all disappeared. It's incredible. I'm so excited. You know? Yeah. Well, um, it it really is a reflection. It's pretty common. People are reporting that anecdotally uh, as they're introducing and uh, maintaining a diet, a meat centric diet. And it's not just any meat, but you want to eat the healthiest meat possible. That they're seeing improvements in their skin and their body all over, pretty consistently. So what I like to say is, the more attractive a human being is, the healthier they are. Yes. Do you know why babies are so cute? Because they're pure. They're not pretty. They are cute because they're so healthy. Yes. Our brains tell us they're cute, but in reality is they don't have any disease. Right. They are so attractive. You just want to stay near them, look at them, cuddle, touch them, have interaction with them because they're that healthy. And then as we age... We lose our cuteness, we lose our attraction because not from our age, but from the accumulation of disease, largely fueled by these inflammatory fat depots, visceral fat, deep subcutaneous fat, muscle fat. And so maybe this would be a good time to show um, an example um, of how much it can impact 
uh, of faiths because our faiths tell the story of our uh, of our house. So yes, I'd like to show a picture of my face at the time I learned about wow. this. Wow! So I look just like every other normal person of how inflamed my face was oh, yeah. at the age of 48. And by the way, I weighed less at that time, 165. So today at the weight of 100, uh, I'm closer to 180 right now, but 178 when this photograph was taken, you can see the considerable change in my face. And I continue to see it. So, you know, get your body in better shape. Well, you can get your face in better shape. My face will never look like a 16 year old again. But what is happening is the shape of my face is, is, is resembling the shape of a 16 year old because I'm eliminating those fat depots, which are also in the face. When we scan down on an MRI, we can see these fat people, uh, depots, buccal fat pads and fat pads up in the temple areas that are filling the face with this inflammatory fat and causing an unattractive look. And that is this fabulous. How long did it take you to go through that much? I mean, obviously this is a 10 year difference, but um, how long did it take you to go through a really dramatic change? And did you start keto, paleo, carnivore? How did you start? Yeah, well, I guess a good way to, to actually illustrate that is to show uh, a series of those photographs in myself over a period of time. So here I am tw in my 20s. Right. And this is me in my 40s. And then you can see I'm developing inflammation here. Maximum amount of visceral fat now at the age 48. And, uh, uh, and so it's a slow progression. And people see this. I mean, if you get your photographs out, you right. will notice by the time you get to your 40s, you're just not as attractive looking. Now, when I was this guy here walking around, I, I had girls that would look at me. I was I was kind of used to it. I mean, I was a typical vain young man. Right. So I'd walk around the beach or a shopping mall, and I liked seeing girls checking me out. Now, girls check out guys the way guys check out girls. We look into their eyes. And when we see an attractive female, we linger. We stay there. And girls were lingering on my face. But by the time I got to this point here and I'm walking around and uh, I'm in a shopping mall, uh, women would look right at me and look right away. Uh -huh. I never saw that in my lifetime. I was used to the lingering look of a, of a female that lingered, you know, on my eyes, my face. And my, I, my feelings were hurt. I'm yeah. a 48 year old former cop, undercover drug agent, and now I got these women who won't look at me. You know, right. they look right away like I'm, you know, like I'm a really ugly dude. It's not that I'm ugly; it's just I'm diseased, and their biological brain says this guy can't help me live better. But as I got rid of my visceral fat, my face starts to get in shape, and you can see the difference here. Now I'm no, you know, statue to David here. But I do have a better shape, a more right. oval shape. And then look at this. You know, so yeah. the period from here to here is five years. Wow. And then it's another three years. And then it's another four years to get from here to here. But Man. you can see that my face shape is changing. Now, That's let me just fabulous. let me just cut to the science. Yeah. My face shape isn't just changing. My appearance on my face is improving. It's time, if you're listening, and it's time the whole country hears, you should be improving with your age. You should be becoming more attractive. Yes. You don't have to buy looking worse as you age. That's what <clears throat> big healthcare, big pharma wants you to believe. You're just supposed to be falling apart, taking more pills. No, you should be becoming more attractive. So what happens now, I mean, I'm married, no good, and you know anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm. I've got a loving family, and you know, and, and a loving relationship with my wife. But now, when I walk down the mall, I'm looking at other people's faces, looking, doing assessments on visceral fat, and I see women looking at me, and they linger, they stay on me, they look at my face, and I imagine that they're saying, "Gosh, I wish my husband looked like that." You right. know, I wish. 
you know, wish, you know, uh, somebody else, I, you know, look like that. So I'm back to getting those lingering looks again. And it really comes down to this. If I was to, you know, add fidelity to it as a researcher, it's because I have the same levels of visceral fat that I have here as an attractive young man, I have today as a 60 year old guy. And, you know, I look, you know, younger people pay attention to me. You know, it's very interesting. Kids used to be kind of afraid of me when I was like here, you know, kids are kind of stranger. Kids look at me, stranger kids, they start smiling at me because their little brain said, this guy lives well. And their yes. little brain says, this is a good, a good human being. So that I like to beautiful. tell my older clients that yeah. you can be a better influencer for your children and your grandchildren, the healthy you are. And if you run a company, you're a social media influencer, you can be a better influencer, the healthier you are getting rid of that visceral fat. So um, Dr. Sean, I'd like to know, you know, what were your steps in those bottom three pictures? What did you go to first and second and third? And then give us guidelines. And I'd like to get into talking about fasting, about intermittent fasting, yeah. but the guidelines for eating, you know, like what yeah. in your mind lets you see this return to from visceral fat to the change? Okay. So the guidelines here is I ate whatever I wanted processed right. foods, carbohydrates, and that was the outcome. And it's pretty much the case with everybody else. Right here is when I learned at this point about carbohydrates. And I started eliminating carbohydrates. Um, and then uh, I went paleo. Um, paleo was a popular diet um, around, I think, in 2013. It was the single most Google term on all of Google, more well, than and anything that was kind else. of that was kind of meat centered, right? Meat centered and whole foods, yeah, so to speak. A lot of a lot of meats, but a lot of a uh, lot of vegetables and uh, and also fruit if it was you know more lower sugar. So I went paleo, but I did I learned about this from a pretty cutting edge, innovative seventeen year old kid. You know, I was shocked when I found out this wow. kid was only seventeen. Um, I thought he was like in his twenties. Um, but he got me to go paleo and to eat fermented foods. So I, I was very fortunate that he got me started on on for those fermented foods because most people that go paleo didn't know about fermented foods. Right. And as it turns out, I mean, it's kind of just interesting side note. This young man was the former sidekick, uh, Dave Asprey from Bulletproof, you know, coffee. You know, oh, right. he's a guy who does, you know, known for bulletproof coffee. And right. He does. He's he's a. I'll I'll put it this way, Dave. If you if this gets to Dave, Dave's a better business guy than I think he is um, a, a person who's trying to solve disease in humans. I mean, I think Dave's Dave's clearly everything is clickbait. Everything is to make money. Um, I, I don't fault him for making money, but but my God, Dave, back off a little bit. So anyway, uh, this guy that taught me was his sidekick, Army, and he kind of had uh, a parting of the ways with Dave. But Army, this young guy, um, you know, did learn, and I think maybe Dave played a role and to that extent. Dave was very early into fermented foods and got Army to eat fermented foods. Um, right. I've eaten fermented for me. foods for years. I mean, my whole, you know, my whole journey has always had fermented foods in it. And it just seems why wouldn't you, you know, it seems really important. Well, you know, uh, why you wouldn't, I guess, um, a lot of carnivores don't eat fermented foods because they, you know, they, they just think, you know, and, and you listen to their credit. I have yet to see a diet improve people more than the carnivore diet. Right. But I still think that the carnivore diet is an imperfect diet. I mean, it, it, nothing is perfect, but the, the, my, my fault with the carnivore diet is um, it doesn't incorporate fermented foods. So I, I just know in my heart of hearts and anecdotally as a researcher that people improve based on the metrics, eliminating visceral fat, deep subcutaneous fat, organ fat, muscle fat, myosteatosis, and it optimizes superficial subcutaneous fat if they um, add in fermented foods. And it nice. is, it's not so much that the foods are beneficial, it's the microbes that come in with those fermented foods. It's, it turns dead food 
into living food and it yes. optimizes the digestive experience. So these microbes are critically important. So um, one of the things I'll point out is here, I'm still eating paleo. Here, I go from paleo to keto. So you can see the influence of keto. And yes. I went from low carb to very low carb. So keto typically is very low carb. And then right at this point, I go from very low carb keto to carnivore. And the only, the only other addition that I'm eating, but no carbohydrates, is ferments. So I don't have any carb, there are no carbohydrates of any consequence in fermented vegetables and fermented fruit if it's adequately fermented. And the way I tell that is um, it, it's, it's got to have an incredible tang that it almost tastes like vinegar. And uh, I, I've, I'm so sensitive to anything sweet, any residual carbohydrates, yes. that I will spit it out of my mouth rather than uh, adding that and contributing in any way um, to my, my microbiome, any carbohydrates. Uh um, and we make our we make our own fermented vegetables at home, and it's really pretty easy. It's not difficult. I know, Same. you know, yeah. Do you too? In the modern world, of course, you can buy them. Um, Today, I recommend people, you know, eat a meat based diet, meat centric diet. Carnivore diet is fine. Uh, any of this in vegan diet, I, I don't want to say it's fine. I will say that you should, you know, if you're going to eat vegan at least add in ferments and cut out all processed foods. But I, I yeah. will say, I will say this about um, veganism. Uh, from my experience working with VJ, you know, the, the Hindu, the true, you know, uh, admirable human being from India who's eating, you know, who's Hindu and is eating this vegan diet. That guy is getting better. That guy is clearly getting better eating a vegan diet. So to my carnivore counterparts out there, I really think it's unfair and it's, it's not an enlightened approach to say that, you know, vegans cannot be healthy and that they can, they, they can be at least more healthy uh, if they adopt a strategy where they're eating, you know, uh, healthier things. I mean, it, there may have been the case that there wasn't any meat around and we would right. have had to consume vegetables, but I think we would, our ancestors um, would have had the knowledge, experience, and instincts to have fermented that food to make it better, nice. you know, healthier for us and less harmful. And so I continue to believe that vegetables in a non-fermented form and fruit, you know, have in the aggregate more potential for harm than benefit. And that those harmful aspects to them are improved through fermentation. Right. Um, but having said that, that's just my experience. And I will say as a dedicated scientist, I reserve the right and want to change my opinion if science shows that, that I'm incorrect about that. So I would love to have more clients that would come and work with me to explore like this brave vegan is doing, you know, uh, VJ. And so I can track you and make decisions. Listen, if you're a wealthy man or woman out there, wealthy enough that you can afford to have MRI scans, why don't you come to our practice? We, we get the best results in the world and let us help you make a dietary determination and life, lifestyle determination. And we'll, we'll put under the video how they can reach you, but you're currently in Minnesota. Is that right? Yes, we're in Minnesota and people have to come to Minnesota because, like I said earlier, we can't read MRI scans in other states. Um, so people come here and we can order those those scans, um, you know, here in Minneapolis. And they're, they're done ex expertly well, perfectly for our protocols. We send somebody, you know, send people to to our, our uh, diagnostic center where we have protocols in place. And uh, we will we will optimize anybody who's interested and become the best biological version of cells. I don't want to say necessarily anybody because we we have to turn around. We get a lot of people that that want to work with us that we can't work with everybody. So we look for people that have the means to be able to do it, afford the MRIs, and also have the willpower, the motivation yes. to do that. That's I'm not interested deal. in working with somebody that's very wealthy um, that just wants to tip their you know to their toe in the pool and you know, try it out. I want somebody that's passionate about 
living the best quality of life that they can possibly live, yeah. understand that, and uh, and we'll, we'll uh, adopt that kind of lifestyle. It fires me up. I'd love to be around those kind of people. And if you're if you're a person that you you know you're not interested in doing that, and you're just going to keep eating crappy food and falling apart, let me just tell you, you're a big drag to Dr. Sean. It bums me out. I don't want to work with you. That's I don't right. want to be around your mojo. You got some bad vibes, uh -huh. you know. Uh, but if you want to, you know, if you're filled with disease and you're like, I'm tired of this, and I want to live a more healthy lifestyle then you can come and work with me and I will show you these tools and strategies to optimize yourself. Beautiful. So your vegan client, um, you had him get rid of processed foods and he's still on his vegan diet, but he's started including fermented vegetables. He basically. did. That was his big inclusion was adding in those fermented vegetables. And um, in India, they do have a fair amount of fermented vegetables, but India's problem is the problem that's going on in Korea uh, and other Asian countries. So what is happening is traditional diets that traditionally always included fermented foods are being replaced and challenged by more modern day diets. So right. what we're seeing is um, younger Koreans and younger Indians are adopting more processed foods like breads and pizzas and muffins and uh, buns and whatnot. And uh, they're abandoning their, their practice of eating fermented foods. Like they have fermented dairy, um, I think, in, in, uh, and other fermented vegetables right. in India. Right. But a lot of the younger people are abandoning that. And India is a mess today. It's a wash with people that are obese. They have yep. you know, chronic disease. A huge problem with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. Mexico is and unbelievable. I mean, Mexico, you know, is just a couple generations down the road from their earlier diet, and so many people overweight and with diabetes. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's spreading. Uh, it's spreading all over the globe, and yeah, you know, I'll, 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 I'll take the moment to to opine on an important subject. And what it is, and, and these these Koreans and Indians and Southeast Asians historically have always been very thin people, healthy people. Yeah, I mean, we studied them in medical school. They had very low incidence of cardiovascular disease, and now that's all changing. And really, what it is before it's the diet; their diet is changing. But what's driving that diet? Microbes. Nice. This is nothing more than an infection spreading from Western unhealthy cultures that are transporting these microbes through airlines into these historically, traditionally very healthy people, and they're all falling apart. Wow. And a good example of this is what's happening within, right here in Minneapolis, within the Somali community. So Somalis um, who live in Somalia are very thin and they look healthy and they are healthy, way healthier. Um, than most other countries. But those same Somalis moved to Minneapolis where their largest population is outside of Somalia, it's happened to be right where I live in Minneapolis. And they go from being very thin and fit to being obese just like other Americans. Now, before you think, well, it's because they're eating American food. They're not. They're not eating American food. They're eating Somali food. They are Muslim, they're traditional, and they eat what's called halal. So sort of like Jewish people will eat a kosher food. Right. And the Somalis are, are eating uh, halal. So they, they eat their, their, their Somali Muslim food in Somali restaurants, Somali grocery stores where they're obligated to, to eat that food. And then they're, they're, they're like confounded. Why are they gaining all this weight? Why are they becoming so diseased? And it's simply because the microbes that they're being exposed to when they shop in Walmart, Target, in the Mall of America, touch handrails, elevators, those American obesogenic microbes, obesity generating microbes wow. are traveling from Americans into these Somalians who are now living here and they're getting diseased and nobody's talking about it. And so Oprah Winfrey, the wealthiest woman in the world is obese 
and is gain weight, lost weight, gain weight, lost weight, simply because she's never treated the infection inside of her that's causing her to be obese. She has obesity generating microbes inside of her that are causing her to have these irrational cravings. And that's really what's going on. And people aren't really ready for this, but the reality is microbes rule the world. We get choices about which ones we wanna get inside of us. If we're enlightened to the lifestyle that we wanna live, that we should be living, so that we get more beneficial microbes inside of us that help us generate muscle and eliminate dangerous fat wow. and overall obtain our health. But it's it's the reality is the single most important strategy that I work, you know, I have my clients um, entertain and I work with them on is optimizing their microbiome. Great point. Fabulous point. Dr. Sean, we've only got a few more minutes. Um, I'd love to just share really quick and how much experience you've had with um, helping people out of prostatitis because it just seems like a plague among men. And my husband ended up, we got referred to Dr. Ken Berry, you know, about a little over a year ago, started keto because of that. And Dr. Ken Berry talked about insulin being the problem, creating inflammation. And my husband had had prostate issues for 20 years. And he'd come to me and gotten on a vegetarian diet. We had been together about five years, six years. He got better and then he got worse. And we just said, there's got to be something different we can do. And we started keto within four months. He had no more prostate symptoms and within, and now he's gone completely carnivore, you know, in the last six months and he just keeps getting better and better. And, um, it just seems like these core cultural issues that are huge. It's such a, such a simple change almost that somebody can make. And I'd like to also see your cardio images before we go, but I'd love for yeah. you to comment on that, on the prostate stuff. And yeah, um, I, I want will. to get into so fasting a nice, too. A nice segue into the cardiovascular imagery that I talk about is, um, is to be able to start initially with the prostate. So my own experience is that I was a guy who knows that inflamed face of 48 year old, I will true confessions admit that I was struggling with uh, not only an inflamed and large prostate, that was having me pee four to five times a night. Getting right. up out of bed. Imagine how much sleep disruption I was getting. I had a client recently come to me who admitted that he was getting 10 to 20 times a night yeah. from an enlarged prostate, just a recent client. So it, it is an enormous impact on your lifestyle. You got to pee that frequently. And when I when I was, by the time I was 48, um, I no longer had a stream. I had a dribble. It was kind of a, right. a, a flow that would drop out of the end of my urethra, the end of my penis, and it would just flow down kind of like a, like a fountain, a very weak, and it would trickle, and it sounded so demasculated. It sounded yeah. so weak. <laughs> and I remember hearing that sound in my father when I was 16, when he would go to the bathroom, and I used to think, my God, what is wrong with him? That sounds horrible. And right. there I am peeing the same way at the age of 48. And then I go paleo with ferments. And that young man didn't say, well, you know, Sean, if you do these things, you're going to start peeing better. All your disease will go away. He just told me you'll lose weight. That's all he was. You know, this was 2010 mm -hmm. or 2009 <laughs> at the time. And so I, I was, I have a big gut and I was getting heavy. And I thought, well, you know, I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start, you know, uh, I'll try this paleo keto, the paleo thing with ferments. And within one year, even I wasn't aware of it, I'm standing in my bathroom and I'm on peeing and I've got this forceful stream. It sounds like Niagara Falls. And I'm thinking about my God, I'm peeing like a man again, like a nice. teenager. And then I remembered that I'm no longer getting up anymore to pee at nighttime. And I, I've told this story before in podcasts, but, you know, you'd think, you know, the average person would be like happy, like I'm super happy. No, I was so freaking pissed off because I felt like I was ripped off and lied to right. and played by the system. Yes. Because in medical school, they just gave me drugs and I was taking all those drugs. Yes. And the only thing that kept happening to me, I was getting worse and they wanted to go up and carve my 
ASS out yeah. and go up through, you know, a rotor rooter job and F that. Yeah. Get yourself healthy. Cut out what is causing the disease. Yes. And get your prostate uh, and your body, all your body healthy. So now I'm peeing like I tell I tell my clients, you know, I I can I think I could pee over a car. That's how strong my urine stream right. is. And you know, you know I think for up. women, I think um, prolapse for women is similar. Yeah. Those tissues it's the exact same thing. falling and down. We see around a prostate is all this inflammatory fat and around the female reproductive organs is all that uh, 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 inflammatory fat, visceral fat. And I'm so glad you brought up prolapse because you know who doesn't bring it up is doctors. Right. Because you know that 50% of the women in the United States will be afflicted with prolapse yes. uh, organs, pelvic yes. organ prolapse, 50%. It's ridiculous. This is a travesty. And they just wait till it's so bad that their uterus or their bladder is coming out of their vagina. Right. I have these older women showing up in the ER with this pink tissue mask coming out of their vagina. Like, what is this? You know, or just found this in my mother or whatever. And you, they'd have to go and get surgery or prolapse. I mean, and, and the cause, visceral fat. It's, right. it, it's just causing relaxation of all your pelvic structures. You get this mom butt. So listen here, you're a 20-year-old, you're a 30-year-old, you're a 40-year-old. And you, you're a woman, you got a little bulge in there. You better wake up yes. and get rid of that visceral fat before those organs and everything in your body starts falling apart. And yes. you've got your uterus coming out of your vaginal canal. I mean, wake up. Your doctor's not going to tell you this. That's right. You're a lady. You're in charge of your body. You read about visceral fat and its connection to ovarian uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And if you're a man and your prostate is falling apart and your erection is weak and you're taking Cialis and Viagra and all these medicines, heads up. Look what's happened. We we do these vascular structures and and, and 6,000 people, we only did 20 of these brain scans towards the end because everybody said, my memory's better, my, I'm more intelligent, uh, I'm not making mistakes, right. what's going on in the brain? So when we scanned the brain, we saw clogged arteries. See that decreased blood flow right there? And this is the uh, right middle cerebral artery. The left middle cerebral artery is so clogged right there, you can't even see any blood in there. And in nine months, we opened up this, doing our strategies, and well, I'm going to give you, um, in just a minute after this, I'll put up my strategy so yeah. you can give it to your, your followers. But look, we opened up that lesion in nine months. And, and we did the same thing just this year in a client, big lesion in their, again, their right middle cerebral artery here. And in, in just three months, we opened that up. Wow. And we see visible pulsation. So arteries, you can see this throb of, of their arteries coming alive. No more like check to feel for a pulse if you find something down. No, you should see a pulse, but we're so diseased today, Carrie, that you can't see pulses because these fatty infiltrates get in the muscle, not only skeletal muscle, but the smooth muscle lining arteries and veins and capillaries impairing the blood flow. So a big one, erectile dysfunction. So you get a weak, weak erection. Here's what we learned. 6,000 people studying, open up their arteries. We get men, half of them are men, uh, they, their erections get hard. But here's one I never heard. This one we figured out. Boom, boom, boom. Your erection, if you're a male, should bounce with every heartbeat. Wow. It should be bouncing. So uh, that is an important sign of vascular health. If you don't have a bounce in your erection, you're wrong. You're diseased. Now, one question I, I don't have because it should be studied is whether a clitoris, an erect clitoris, should also throb too. But right. nobody's doing these studies. The males are, you know, they call me up and talk to me about my women clients. I haven't invited them to talk to me about their clitoral erections, but the males, they'll call me up and they'll tell me, I got the bounce, Sean. I got the, and they're very excited. Now, the bounce happens very small initially. And, uh, you know, when you're a 16, 17 year old, Kid, it looks like this, and it just slowly goes away. And by the time you're a 48 year old guy, you don't have that bounce anymore, and you got a soft erection. And or maybe you're a 60 year old guy, and you got a soft erection. What, whatever age you're beset with erectile dysfunction, but blood flow, blood flow, blood flow is everything. 
and it gets mediated through visceral fat. And the best strategy is optimizing the microbiome. Yeah, okay, so the fat around the heart is called um, cardio fat, and I can pull those up too, besides the arteries. The, and you'd the think maybe a vegan vegetarian who's got visceral fat probably has fat around the heart. They do. It always corresponds. We've never seen um, visceral fat without seeing heart fat. So it always corresponds. Same thing with muscle fat. You got visceral fat, you got fat in your muscle, you got fat around your heart, and you're going to have fat around your, in your walls of your arteries, veins, and your capillaries, where all the magic happens, where all the blood and nutrients gets released so, through, through the, the, the exchange. So, so the biggest question, fat. Dr. Sean, one of the biggest questions I'll have vegetarians ask me because they've been so programmed over the years is, oh, what about my cholesterol? Isn't my cholesterol going to go up? If, if I, I have my way, I would make it a law that you would find or imprison a, a physician from talking about cholesterol. I think it's the biggest distraction out there. Let me just cut to the chase. If you're listening, one person, can you name one person that has improved their cholesterol and it ever improved their life? The whole system is foisted upon doctors and their patients thinking that all you got to do is improve your cholesterol. It's craziness. You should be paying attention to this visceral fat. It's got a direct relationship to disease. The cholesterol is all over the place. It's a waste of time. I hate talking about it. Right. Because when you talk about cholesterol, you distract from what really matters. Visceral fat, fat around the heart, clogged arteries, deep subcutaneous fat. These are the things that every time you eliminate, people get better. Okay. Every single time. But when yes. you, you fix cholesterol, nothing. Yes. Thanks Just for that. Money answer. for the system. Thanks for that answer. And yeah, your review of your your advice to us, your list, and um, what do you think about olive oil, butter, and then when so you're kind of butter, but, but you know, there's better butter. Butter from the best animal possible. A grass fed, grass finished animal is going to produce a healthier animal products right um olive oil i'm not it's not like i'm really opposed to it but if i get a choice between butter and olive oil i will go with um with uh butter over uh olive oil but um it's it's just something that um that i'm kind of a little bit neutral on but here are my strategies <clears throat> and you can if you're watching today you can take a screenshot of those and um i put this on social media uh, these are the things that will reverse chronic disease, reverse visceral fat, reduce heart fat, reverse deep subcutaneous fat, help you put on superficial, beneficial, superficial subcutaneous fat, help you look better, help you live better. Um, they're all really easy to do, except for these two things here, optimizing the microbiome, nitric oxide, oxytocin, um, uh, vitamin D, uh, optimizing your sodium levels, your mitochondria, uh, melanin, autophagy. These are, you know, adiponectin. These are harder to do. Um, they require intensive research. You got to get into the studies, but you know, uh, your choices are this. I'll just cut to the chase. You can come to me and work with me and I'll tell you how to do those things. Or you can work with my coaches. My coaches are really good options. When you come to me, I'm a physician. My startup charges a lot more money, but our coaches that you can work with um, you can get to through my links and my social media, uh, my visceral fat uh, reduction uh, specialist and health optimizing uh, specialist. They can work with you on how to do these things. And, and uh, it's a great option. But if you have more money than you have time and you don't, time is, is, is more valuable to you than money, you should just come to me and I will, I will cut you the chase because you want to eliminate your risk in case you're going to have a heart attack next week and die you know, uh, not the fear monger, but, you know, I did have a client who showed up late for his MRI scan and uh, his assistant called me up crying and said, John died yesterday, literally the day before he was supposed to have his, his visceral fat scan. He dropped dead of a heart attack. So, you know, the sooner you get started on, you know, health optimization, the better. And uh, this visceral fat is is very much causal and associated with 
the biggest killers, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, um, and uh, neurodegenerative disorders. So get started doing these strategies. If you have the financial ability to get MRI scans, come and work with me. Um, and if you, if you don't, you can take a more modest approach and maybe work with my, uh, my specialist who will coach you how to, how to do these things too. Awesome, Dr. Sean. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. How about a little bit just touching on um, intermittent fasting and fasting? I want to tell you this. I did just a two-day fast. I was going to start doing two and then three and then four, you know, each month or every few weeks. I didn't know how often you like to do it or how you recommend it. But you know what? When I did that two-day fast, it was so easy. It was a million times easier than when I used to be eating carbs all the time. It was like nothing because yeah. I'm sure my insulin resistance, my had changed so much that fasting was like easy. And I heard you say a while back, you know, women don't think fasting is for them. I think it is. I think it's a fabulous regenerative tool, but, um, tell us a little bit about that. And, um, yeah, yeah well, yeah. I agree with you. So your last point I'll hit first. Listen, um, females are, are a 50% of our species, and there's no way women, our ancestors, did not fast. Now, it wasn't volitionally, it was situation. I mean, we would, we would eat when we had, you know, meat to eat, you know, there's a successful hunt, but there wasn't always food around to eat. And so we would have, by necessity, gone through extended periods of time, famine, starvation, deprivation, and we wouldn't have had access to that food. And it's during that time that our bodies acclimated, our species acclimated um, to being deprived caloric intake from food. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, we developed a very beneficial uh, process called autophagy. And autophagy is this wonderful condition where our, our cells literally start cleaning house and uh, you start getting rid of um, this, uh, this cellular debris that's a consequence of just living. And uh, so autophagy is a fantastic benefit and it's linear in terms of, you know, dose dependency with regard to uh, it, it, it in fasting. So the longer you fast, the more uh, autophagy you, you actually will get. And so it maxim, it's maximized at about uh, 60 to 72 hours. And so my recommendation for my clients over about three to six months, is to get people to start fasting about three to four days every single week. So three to four day wow. um, uh, 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 fast every single week is a huge uh, investment, but with considerable returns. However, do not try to do a three day fast unless you're more like Carrie that you've been you know keto carnivore for a while because yes. your dependency on carbohydrates are going to leave you feeling very weak and tired and yep. discouraged. And the last thing I want to worry about is one human being having a bad experience fasting when it's so magnificently beneficial. It optimizes your microbiome, improves your cells, it improves your mitochondria, gives you more energy, just makes your skin and your face and your body look so much better and perform so much better. So how should you approach fasting? Slowly increase it over about three to six months right. go from no fasting up to about three to four days. It's not a race. Health optimization is a journey. It's yes. not a light switch. So you just slowly increase, um, just, just slowly, slowly increase your fasting till you get to that point. Yeah. And can we um, just explain, I totally agree with you a thousand percent. And I think people need to be patient with themselves. They're like, I want a 30 day, you know, change, but the truth is it's a journey and it's get on that journey and be on it and stay on it and be committed to it and see that really, really strong change over time. But autophagy um, is when the body starts eating up its old debris. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, I call it cleaning house. You know, you get rid of, it's almost like you take a hoarder, you know, they've got all this, you know, hoarding, you have three, four feet stack of garbage through their house. And when you start doing autophagy, you clean out that house. And now that house functions so much better. People can live in it so much better. 
And uh, I think autophagy is even better than that example. It has that even more of an impact than cleaning out a hoarder house. Um, you just can't overestimate the benefit that autophagy has on the human body. You just, it's an imperative. I get every one of my clients to an extended fasting. That's great. Well, Dr. Sean, I just want to thank you so, so, so much for being on with us today, answering that rabbit hole about the vegan vegetarian. I know there's a lot of people wondering about that right now, and this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, Carrie. I appreciate the opportunity to share, share this information with you and your audience. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I wish you all the best and uh, I'd be happy to come back and do another show soon. Great. And we'll be following you on social media, on YouTube. Your videos are great. Such an excellent trail of information that you're putting out. And thank you for speaking your truth and for standing for what you know to be right. It's beautiful. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Adios.